So a couple of a few announcements before we get started. Uh, we have a new committee member, uh, Sean Carter, the, ma the manager from studios. Uh, uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, your contribution to the group will be appreciated. Um, these uh, meetings can only be done uh, if uh, we keep them alive, so uh, thank you. Uh, another announcement, Christopher Crow from AECOM has stepped down. Apparently he uh, undertake another uh, commitment that's gonna prevent him from coming into our group, but thank you very much for his contributions. Um, we also are featuring this month uh, the Loop One Node, and I'm gonna present that in a little bit. Um, it's about a 15 minute presentation on what is that strange uh, node and how we can help us uh, manipulate geometry and list information. And after my 15 minute uh, presentation, uh, I am honored to uh, have as a guest uh, Jeffrey McGree. McGee? McGrew. McGrew. Yeah, sorry. Right. Um, he is uh, founder and CEO of uh, uh, Because We Can, and uh, he is uh, uh, doing a lot of work on fabrication side, utilizing parametric methods. So he's going to share a bit uh, what is he doing, what some work he's done with us. Um, next month we have a really, really great speaker. We have uh, Mustafa Rusadi. He is, you haven't heard of him before. He is the developer of Ladybug, uh, which started as a grasshopper application, but he has uh, recently uh, created uh, an analogy set of nodes for Dynamo, and he's going to show how that works and some of the applications. He is based in the East Coast, so uh, but he's going to be connected remotely. He's, he's very gracious to stay late and uh, give us a demonstration from there. Um, again, call of we're always in the search of speakers and. The committee is uh, always uh, trying to reach out to events, people, uh, projects that you heard, uh, present them here and uh, help us uh, push forward the knowledge, the shared knowledge of uh, Dynamo. Thank you, IDA, for the sponsorship of the food. Um, and uh, with that said, I think we can get started. So I'm going to do a very quick uh, introduction of this uh, loop, of this node, it's the loop while. And <coughs> this uh, node came to my attention when I was just browsing through all the different uh, nodes available on uh, the out of the box uh, uh, nodes. And uh, when I first looked at it, I'm like, what is that? So it's one of those nodes that you don't know what they are for and you're very easily dismissed. But then I start uh, looking into it, and looking into forums, and trying to get a sense of how it could be used. And um, I think I got a little bit of understanding of how uh, we can uh, utilize it for manipulating geometry, especially when it comes to the optimization of uh, objects. So the, the background behind those words, loop while, I think it has to do with some uh, uh, programming language. So my first stop on trying to understand that is to go back into the loop while uh, functions in Python. And uh, this gave me this, uh, this kind of graph. So the, the loop while, uh, function in programming, it's an event that occurs that is uh, initialized by a start point. <coughs> and then it runs through a conditional statement uh, to validate whether it wants to proceed with uh, executionable code, uh, if it meets certain conditions, or in, if, if it doesn't meet those conditions, then it finalizes the, the actions. So this is very common and, uh, and very typical in all uh, the programming world. Uh, 
And this uh, node has a little bit to do uh, with this uh, uh, type of diagrammatical uh, uh, course of events. Um, <coughs> so uh, an example of that is this very, very simple code. So on this screen, you have an initializer. And an initializer, it's, uh, it's, it's an element that we want to evaluate. In this uh, case, uh, this uh, initializer is a equals one. And this has this is Python, so this has nothing to do with the with the node yet. But I'm starting with this to establish the parallel. So the uh, the conditional expression is that while the, there's a sequence of numbers that is less than ten, then something's going to happen. And what's going to happen? The the the, the workflow is going to print the uh, value and then it's going to update the initializers uh, by two units. Uh, <coughs> so the, in the output, I expect to see a list of elements that increment in, uh, in, uh, in two units until it gets to the maximum allowed uh, value the, uh, uh, for the conditional expression and finalize at that point. Cool. So in this output, uh, I will start to see a list of uh, objects, a list of uh, numbers, starting with uh, number one. And then uh, uh, the executable action is to print that object uh, and increase the initializer by two. So my first item uh, is going to be 1 plus 2 is 3. Right? Then uh, the next initializer will be 3 plus 2 5. The next one is going to be 5 plus 2 7. And then 7 plus 2 9. And then when it gets to 11, 11 doesn't meet the requirements anymore. And that's why it stops right there. Uh, um, so when we're talking about the loop while, we have a very similar condition. We have an initializer uh, that starts the sequence of events. And then we have a, a while expression, which is a conditional statement that uh, 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 condition which numbers or which sequence uh, are going to run through the loop. And the loop is just an execution of a code. Uh, the execution of the code in this uh, condition also update initializer and return restart the sequence again uh, the initializer inputs uh, lists of objects or list of numbers uh, and the continue while uh, the conditional expression and the loop body are are functions so we basically need to input in those a function that determine a conditional uh, statement and a function that determine a set of uh, actions. So I have four examples that I'm not going to run uh, live. I'm just going to show them on the screen um, that express that uh, condition. If I look back at my original uh, uh, sequence of events, I start with an initializer, then I uh, add a function, a conditional function, and I finalize with a execution. Uh, so here's a very simple uh, definition. And what this is looking is um, it's looking at a very simple expression. It's just uh, the initializer. It's uh, it's uh, an integer number one. What is what am I going to in, uh, what I'm going to apply to that uh, uh, initializer is uh, a very simple sum. So I'm going to add one unit to the initializer. Uh, and continue that operation until I get to a value of 10. 
when the sequence gets above 10, it's going to stop. So I have a, the, the whole sequence is started with 1, then 2, then 3, then 4. Uh, and if, if I start from the start, you know, if I have an expression number 1, then I add another number that's 2. 2 is less than 10. Uh, <coughs> Therefore, it can continue uh, with the operations until it gets to number 10. Uh, 10 is less than equal than 10. So I can add one number, and that's why you see that the result of this operation is 11. Does that make sense? Uh, this is applying a loop while uh, operation to a single expression. Uh, uh, there is a conditional uh, expression, uh, the continuum while expression, that uh, applies a restriction uh, to the loop. So the loop is a sequence of numbers and it's going to stop when it gets a 10, it gets to 5. So inside this node, there is an internal operation that uh, creates, a, evaluates all the values between 1 and 10 and stops there because it's no longer meeting the conditional statement. That makes sense. So when it no longer meets the conditional statements, the operation stops and this is the result, which is why it's So this is 11, is that the number of the <coughs> Or is it just the last item? It's the last item. Can you get the whole list? No, it doesn't. And that's the that's one of the drawbacks of this. <coughs> that is a very simplified um, expression um, of the of the true Python code. Um, but it can work with lists, and I'll show you in the, the next example. All right, the next example is uh, it's, uh, something more tangible. I'm going to apply a loop while operation to a point. And instead of having a singular expression as my initializer, I'm going to start with uh, geometry in this point. In this case, it's uh, a point at 0, 0. So the origin point is my initializer, and I'm going to apply a function to that, to that point. The function is I'm going to apply a translation. I'm going to move that point by a certain distance. The distance is driven by a vector. And because the vector only has a coordinate in C, it's going to increase the location of this point by one unit. Now, it's going to do that until it meets the conditional statement. The conditional statement says when the when the loop gets to a value of 10, stop the operation. Um, now, because the continue while is a function, the, this input needs to receive uh, a function. And the note that I used to do that is the function .compose, which basically uh, creates a point on the z uh, direction. And uh, it's limited by a factor of 10. When it gets to that point, it is no longer going to create additional points and we're going to stop there. So in the background, you see that I have, this is the, the, the point at 0, 0. And then that point starts getting moved by increments of 1. When the, when the point gets to an elevation of Z, 10, no longer meet the conditional statement, so the function doesn't apply anymore. So it stops there, and it yields the last value, which is a point at a elevation uh, z of, of z eleven. Does and that make ten or eleven points, or just one point? <coughs> just one point. It's just moving the point. It's just moving the point. And why eleven? 
you get it? Why why not ten? Because it's a, it's it's a evaluating points with a C maximum of ten, and then when it gets to ten, because it has the less or equal, then you add one value, and then one, that one value is what you see see here on the C. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So this is a very uh, this is just with a very simple geometry and this is just a one point. Let me show you another example, uh, and this is just with uh, with a line. I don't know if you can you can read from here, uh, but the in this case I'm utilizing again another loop while operation to extend a line. Uh, up to a certain limit, and that limit is driven by the size of the length. <clears throat> so I have here a simple line, start end point. You can do it this with uh, with nodes. I could do also operationally with expressions. Uh, the output of this it's it's a line from zero, which is the origin, to a, a z value of one. It's, it's a line of the one dimensional unit. <clears throat> so what is the action I want to apply to that line? I want to extend that line. And you see there is a node out of the box called the curve extend n by one unit. Uh, and it's going to be extending this line by one unit unless until it hits a limit. And what's the limit? The curve length equal five. So when, when the length of that line reaches a maximum of five, it's going to stop the operation, and I'm going to get a single curve that is extended up to that limit. Does that make sense? It's like moving the point, but in this case, I'm stretching a uh, line. Stretch the line from the start point, which is the origin, increments of one, and stop, then I get to a value of five. That makes sense? No? Yes. All right, let's look at one. It does make sense. It would have been cooler if it left the other points. If, if the other points were left, so you can see. Um, different points on the line or something like that and it's like just the last point but I understand it's just a function of this middle right so you see the blue line here this is the blue line we started with mm -hmm. this is zero zero is the first point and the second point is the it's a point and one unit in the z direction so you see this point here that's the second point this is the original line I started with. Mm -hmm. And then I apply this operation, extend it, until it reach, until it no longer meets the conditional expression, which is okay. five. So the total length of this is five units. And that's what I'm getting here. That makes sense. All right, we did a line, we did a, I'm gonna do another line, but in this case is a circle and it just follow the same logic. Um, I start with a circle that is one unit in radius and it's placed in the origin. That's the circle by center point radius. Uh, <clears throat> what I'm gonna do with that circle? <clears throat> I wanna scale this circle by an amount of two. <clears throat> So I'm going to scale it as many times as the conditional allow, allow it to be. Uh, and the conditional says that when the radius hits a maximum size of 4, stop the operation. So <clears throat> uh, when the circle radius hits the, hits the 4 limit, then it's scaled by 2, and that is the last item. And that's why I'm getting a circle with a radius of eight. That's the last of three.
That makes sense. Um, <coughs> And it, it, basically, these are simple examples, and uh, from here you can start thinking about what are the potential uses of this. I mean, certainly, when you want to run a geometry to a series of operations to find like the optimal value uh, based on a condition, then that is one possible uh, application. Um, another application, it's uh, the next one. And I think I'll close with that one. And this is a this is rather <coughs> inventive. This is a I have a list from one to ten, and the problem is randomize the location of this list and divide it in two lists, and the sums of the list needs to be approximately. Uh, uh, the half of the total sum. Or in other words, randomize, randomize the list and divide it in two parts of approximately equal sum. So it's going to sum all the elements in the list. This is the math sum. This is 55. And then <coughs> the sum of these two different lists has to be equal half of that equation. So that will be this information divided by two, that's 27.5. <clears throat> so what I'm trying to do is uh, uh, I apply the list shuffle command. Yeah, that, that's going to move the, <laughs> the indexes of the different elements inside the list. Uh, <clears throat> And from here, uh, I'm going to apply a function. What is the function? What, what do I want to do with this list? I want to find this, the rest of the items. <coughs> and the rest of the items is uh, you know, the first list. If you think about the rest of the items, I pick the first item, <coughs> index one. The rest of the items is index uh, from index one to index nine. Uh, so what <coughs> what is the conditional statement? That the conditional statement is that the the rest of the items cannot be more cannot sum more than twenty seven point five. So if I if I break this down internally, I mean the first item is going to be three. Three, the sum of three plus three is plus zero is three. Uh, so that meets the requirements. Uh, then I go to the next one. One, three plus one is four. Four is less than 20, 27.5, so it keeps it in the list. Nine, nine plus four is 13. That's less than 27.5, keep it in the list. So it keeps applying the same rule until it gets to value 10. The aggregate sum of all of this is 27. 27 is still less than 27.5. Keep it in the list. So then it gets to the next one. The next item in the list is 7. That doesn't meet the, the, the function anymore, and that's why it stops there. So. The, the list, the rest <coughs> of the items, have a maximum sum of 27. And then to find it, the rest of the numbers, I use the difference. So my list A is uh, this list. And list B is this other list. And I can shuffle the numbers by rerunning the definition again from, from scratch. And I'm going to get. Uh, different results, but the sum is going to be somewhat around 27.5. that make sense? Sometimes you want to uh, create a distribution of location of objects that meet this type of requirements. So uh, this is one example of how to do that. Uh, 
Et quoi c'est All right, I'm going to post all these definitions on our websites. So if you want to play with them, uh, you can do so. Just be warned that sometimes uh, uh, the if the conditional statement doesn't close the loop, you may find yourself in an infinite loop. And what that means is the node continue processing this until infinite, and then it's going to crash. For example, when, when I create something like that, um, I'll use the previous example. If instead of changing less or equal operator, I would say it's larger than four, my start, my start point is it's, it's zero, point at, uh, at origin, and then my my function compose doesn't close the loop, it's actually leaving it open to any value that is larger than four. So that brings the number of possibilities to infinite. So this is gonna be keep running and running and running until it crashes. So, uh, so that's uh, one of the uh, limitations. Is there any possibility for nested loops? Um, like a loop inside another loop? Yeah, that's totally possible. Uh, an example would be, uh, so here I'm subdividing this, this, this in two lists, right? So what if I want to do three buckets or four buckets with the same reward? Then I will have to, act on this bother, I need to apply another loop. And then on the result of that, I need to apply another loop uh, that meets the maximum math sum of the total divided by three or divided by four. So it's a, a loop inside of the loop. Uh, other questions? So if that's it, then I'll pass the the presentation to Jeffrey. All right. <clears throat> okay. Should I share my desktop or? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Look at that. All right. Great. Um, spin this around real quick and, and face everybody. All right. Thanks a ton, Susan. Thanks, everybody, for being here. <clears throat> My name's uh, Jeffrey. I'm recovering from a little bit of a head cold, so I'm going to be a little not quite as uh, animated as I normally am. But I uh, hope you can bear with me. Uh, I run a little company. We're a design build architecture firm called Because We Can. We do uh, architecture and interiors and um, creative fabrication and a bunch of other stuff. There's actually two people from my company right there, which is almost half my company because our, <coughs> our company is tiny. <coughs> and actually, a lot of this work that you're going to see tonight is the result of B's uh, programming. And I'll probably drag you up at some point uh, later here if that's OK, B. Uh, because if the questions get too technical, B is the one that, that can actually answer them. So uh, just real quick, just as an as a intro for uh, you know what my company is and what we do. Um, as I was saying before, we uh, do creative interiors, a lot of commercial interiors. At the top left there is the Interval here in San Francisco. Who, who's been to the Interval? Oh, wow, hardly anybody. All right, well, we built that. <laughs> Came out great. Uh, we do some residential work, we do some commercial office interior work, and we also do some custom fabrication. Like on the bottom left here, these were some kiosks that we made for an art gallery down in uh, San Jose so that they could roll them out on the street and open them up for uh, like kind of adjunct mini galleries that they could move around for different events and stuff like that. And then uh, more recently, sometimes we just make really goofy stuff, to be honest. On the top left there are some uh, fake AstroTurf hills that we just made uh, for one of our projects. On the top right is a friend's project that we helped out with, these uh, art cars for Burning Man. Um, and then the bottom two here are, are 
fairly recent projects that we just did where we started to use Dynamo for fabrication. So this is the first project that we actually heavily used. This is a, a thing that we got roped into um, where studios, and we do this from time to time where we get uh, collaborate, we get called upon to collaborate with a larger commercial architecture firm to help uh, with like creative fabrication or creative elements. So uh, this is for a, a big nameless client in Southern, uh, in South Bay, um, who studios had this idea where they wanted these shipping containers turned into like funky lounge, nap room, meeting space sorts of things. But they really just had placeholders for them and, and had us like help riff a bunch of ideas of what they could be and we worked back and forth. And this was one of the two uh, that we fabricated. And as you can see here, the triangles uh, make this nice kind of organic interior and the, the seam, the gaps between the triangles grows as it gets higher up, you know. And um, some, of the, some of the triangles are upholstered. That's Joel from our company uh, hanging out inside of there. And um, one of the things that we had to do to do this in a, in a kind of effective way that wasn't going to take forever is, um, you know, when, you, when you're making something like this, each one of these triangles is unique, right? And we started out using adaptive components because most of what we do is inside of Revit. Uh, so we started using adaptive components to kind of model this out, but it was getting really slow. Um, and also, you know, it was working okay to be able to control the gap size and all that sort of stuff. But just iterating through every single one of those triangles and uh, isolating it for fabrication, and then also tracking which triangle is which and where it goes in the overall assembly uh, can become really unmanageable project uh, projects really quickly. Because one of the awesome things about digital fabrication is it makes things very quickly and it can make totally unique things, but that's the downside is you can quickly introduce more complexity than you can reasonably manage. Because we did this whole thing in like uh, four weeks, I think it was, from when the shipping containers dropped on the floor to where they went out to the client. I think so, right B? It was like four weeks or even less. It might have been less. It was pretty crazy, but at any rate. Um, you know, so like we don't have time to do this by hand and, and this is one of the huge upsides of digital fabrication in general is it can empower, uh, you know, much the way that like BIM and Revit have empowered people to where you're not like pushing lines around in your elevations to update your elevations. Like, you know, they just get updated for you by you editing the model. Here we can use computer automation to automate this kind of brute force tasks to help us, to empower us so that with a small team we can do more complex stuff and do it on time and on budget and everything like that. So one of the big problems that we had was uh, uh, edge labeling, right? So I was saying like which triangle goes where is a huge problem. And then also isolating every single one of those triangles out so that they're ready for getting CNC cut. Um, because, uh, you know, for each of these, um, you know, whatever you're, whenever you're dealing with a fabrication problem for digital fabrication, there's this isolation step where it's like we have our model and our model might be very complete, right? And it's invariably um, will happen sometimes when we're collaborating with other designers is they'll say, hey, I have a model, like a Rhino model or a Revit model or something. It's fully detailed, ready to fabricate. How, you know, so this project is almost done, right? Where actually, you know, having a really good model is only about the first third of the process of actually building building something. The other two thirds of the problem involves a lot of, you know, data management, a lot of issues around uh, these sorts of things. And so this isolation step is all about getting all of your individual parts and pieces out of your model and into the right format that they need to be to go to whatever process downstream uh, those things are getting fed to. So like if you're water jet cutting these out of steel you probably need them in a different file format than if you're 3D printing them. And you also need them in a different file format if you're going to be CNC routing them like we are here, right? So um, so one of the things that we had to do, uh, Dynamo out of the box when we started using it, and I think this was, we started this in version eight, I think it was B? Seven? Yeah, it was version seven. Um, you know, Dynamo couldn't label things and actually didn't even have a font. Right, so you couldn't write fonts on things in Dynamo. So that was one of the first things B had to do was invent a, her own line font uh, inside of Dynamo so that we could label edges, uh, which we did. So, and all of this is collected into a series of nodes that uh, a package that you can just download. Uh, it's because we Dynamo, it's also up on GitHub. Um, all the code is open source and up on GitHub with examples and everything like that as well. So, um, so everything that I'm talking about here is totally public and you guys can go muck around with it and have fun and whatever. Um, so one of the first things we had to do was 
figure out a way to label edges, right? That was a big one. So we had to kind of reinvent the wheel um, and make it to where Dynamo could write font and then also put the font on things, right? But then we also had to have a way that um, Dynamo could walk the mesh and identify which edges faced each other so that these two triangles here would have the same number, you know, from that edge to that edge so that this edge and this edge, when we cut this thing out and those numbers are inscribed on the back of the triangles, you know those are the two edges that are supposed to go next to each other when you go to assemble it, right? Um, and then the another thing that we had to do, which was kind of ironic, is um, Dynamo couldn't export to uh, DXF, right? Uh, and a lot of uh, two and a half D digital fabrication processes rely on vector-based formats like uh, e uh, EPS or DXF or kind of like the standards, and so. Uh, B had to write her own DXF exporter uh, inside of Dynamo, which the, we thought was kind of ironic because we're like, this is an Autodesk tool and Autodesk invented the DXF format, and yet Dynamo can't actually talk to any of that yet. So, um, and that's coming now that I guess the newest version of Dynamo actually does have some exporting is supposedly on the way, but like we're still using our own um, Homeworld uh, thing there. So then <clears throat> this is kind of the final, final result. So there's B sorting through the triangles right there. So we have little connector pieces that screwed onto the back of every triangle. And, uh, and so, and there was pilot holes that were made by the CNC router so that you knew the spacing that these things were supposed to be. So that just by putting the connector on the back, it would make the gap the right size of where it was supposed to be. You know, that's how we were able to control this nice effect where down here, the gaps are narrow and up here, the gaps get wider because we wanted this kind of cool effect like it was getting more airy you know, as it went up. Um, and then here you can kind of see, it's a little hard to see because the picture's small, but um, you can see where the where the labeling is. And in this instance, for this first version, we actually had um, the CNC router carve the letters in the back of every panel, um, which took a, too long. And in the next iteration, you'll see we actually did a, a different thing. So, but this is the first thing we did. This is just about a year ago, just a little over a year ago. Um, when we did this, uh, when we did this project, and so this was when we first started like diving into the deep end. Uh, we've used Dynamo for stuff before, but it was always your more standard BIM kind of like I want to solve a particular computational problem or I want to iterate through something to try to find an optimal solution or something like that. This is where we started actually getting into it in terms of uh, more for fabrication. So then, who who went to Autodesk University this year? So a couple hands. Okay. So we made these that were there next to the Hive Pavilion. So this, again, was a very short turnaround project. Um, it was about a month where Autodesk was originally planning on putting something else right here, and then that something else wasn't able to make it to the show, so they called us up about a month before AU, and they were like, hey, can you build a crazy thing? And we're like, yeah, we can build a crazy thing. And then we all frantically worked like mad and built the crazy thing and put it in the back of a truck and shipped it there. Um, but this was kind of like the second version of that Dynamo tool set. And, uh, uh, you know, as you can see, we're doing a couple things. In the old version, in the first, in that shipping container, our connector piece was actually just a cut piece of metal that you could just bend to be the angle that it needed. So as you put the thing together, you would just bend those things to the angle that was needed to get the thing to work out, right? Because you could tell like, okay, this one's here and here's the pilot holes for the other one, so these two need to move this far over and then I need to bend the tab to get it to work. We thought that was a clever idea. Turns out it was way too much work to bend all those tabs and to get everything to line up. So uh, instead what we did is we actually came up with a connector piece. So this was where uh, the uh, Dynamo, we worked and did more uh, Dynamo scripting so that you'd be able to bring in a mesh, have Dynamo parse the mesh. And at this point, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, B, at this point we kind of abandoned using Revit uh, as the modeler um, and started to just like feed meshes into Dynamo. Um, you could still feed it a Revit mesh or something from Revit. It was just taking so long for the geometry engine of Revit and the adaptive components to just brute force its way through it. And it was so much faster to just give it a simple mesh. So we just give it a simple mesh and it would just crank through it very quickly. So we started just, okay, we'll just start feeding it simple meshes and using our same rationalization tools that we built to kick it out the other side. So what this is doing is it's actually uh, these connectors that connect all this stuff together uh, were never modeled, right? Those are getting resulted from the script. Like the script is making those for us and they're all the right angles that they need to do. So our Dynamo stuff is looking at like, 
these two panels looking at what their angle is this way and then drawing that connector automatically with the hole with the through holes you know and on the connector side it's got holes in it that accept hardware so that these could all bolt in because these need to be able to flat pack down for shipping and come apart and go back together and stuff like that so all of this it all bolted together with it like a little allen key like ikea style um that worked okay uh, the hardware was a little tricky and some of the getting the things to line up just right sometimes you had to get it to line up just right to get it to thread sometimes and that became not that ideal so again in our next rev we kind of changed it but um as you can see you know the connectors were labeled and the panels were labeled so there's a label on the panel and then every place where a connector was supposed to go was labeled and that number corresponds to that connector so we just sorted all these things out by numbers they had coded numbers so you just had piles in the shop of like here's the tens here's the 20s here's the 30s you know and then uh b made this awesome tool as well where you could you could search for where, where the panel was that you needed <laughs> so you could be like i'm looking for panel 205 and it would light up on the model where 205 was so you could figure out where it was supposed to go <clears throat> and um and so again we built these really quickly and it it worked it worked pretty well um and then <laughs> the latest thing that we did is, uh, is the seating units for a big uh, commercial interior that we just wrapped up over in Oakland. A, a co-working company took an old defunct building in Oakland that hadn't really been seriously used for like 15 or 20 years and turned it into a big co-working campus, you know? And, uh, and we, brought it, we were brought in to do like, kind of reinvent the interior and make it more interesting and attractive and usable and all that. One of the things we did is build these crazy, we were calling them icebergs. Um, the client wanted the seating unit sort of thing. They'd seen this like artist installation that was kind of interesting that they really liked and wanted to do something kind of along those lines, but kind of different. And so we came up with this concept for these like prismatic forms that are like all overlapping in different ways. So you can like, you know, sit and stand and rest and perch like all kinds of different ways all through this like landscape, you know, of, of stuff. But we needed a way to quickly and easily build these things, right? So, so we um, again came back to Dynamo. But one of the things here is we we were able to figure out um, here, you know, it's all triangles, right? Because when we started out, it was like, well, okay, it's really easy to deal with triangles. Triangles are always flat; you never have to worry about that, and you can just crank them out. So this one and the and the um, and this, you know, it's all triangles. It's super easy to deal with that. Here, um, B was able to get the code to work to where now we can just have it work with any old arbitrary end gone. So as long as those surfaces are flat, you can just feed it a mesh and it will just crank out all the panels and all the connectors. So here's our connectors, you know, and same thing. See, it's labeled the edge. And here we just made a Sharpie holder for the CNC router. So if you just hold a Sharpie and draw on the panels and then you'd swap out the Sharpie for a cutting bit and then cut everything out. Yeah. Are the numbers also in the, coming from uh, the Dynamo? Yeah. Thing? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's all you get. You hand it a mesh. It hands you back numbered, ready to cut out parts. It's like just pipeline right out the other side. So, um, yeah. So, uh, and you can see there's the numbers there. You know, and uh, and this one we did a bevel, and that's a it's a clearance bevel, so that we could get these reveals to be really nice and consistent you know, all the way around the piece. And uh, and then we made a thing where it actually bumps into the reveal. So these connectors actually recess into the reveal and come back out. That way these, when you're putting these together, you could just take this piece and put it right up against where it's supposed to go and screw it down. And then, because it's registering itself based off that bevel, and then take the next panel and bring it in and screw it into place. And with some of these, we would just, Put them together and then lift them off of Joel, who was in, inside of it. He'd put like he'd be inside to like screw the last panel into, into place. Then we just lift it up and crawl out and set it to the side, and then start building the next one. So, um, so again, we were able to build these pretty quickly. And um, and you know the cool thing is this is uh, for most of them. I think there's only one or two where we had to add some additional support. Otherwise, it's all air inside of there. It's all just these connectors. That are holding it together so we can really make any arbitrary shape you can imagine as long as it's made up of flat planes you know and uh it worked out pretty well so uh that's all the slides we can hop over to some dynamo stuff too 
Um, if you want just some more examples of some of the stuff that we've been in the in the middle of or that we've done in the last few years. Um, any questions about the projects specifically that we did? Yeah. How do you optimize the uh, mesh? You know, the first project that you showed right. has a kind of you know, cube form and then you apply the triangles. Yeah. Do you use any specific customized tool to generate this? So the question is, how do we optimize for the mesh? In this one and in this in this one, uh, we modeled it in Revit just using adaptive components. And, and so what we did is we had a series of splines as a as a rig, you know, that are adaptive component triangles we're hanging off of, so you could adjust the splines and kind of get the shape that you wanted to get. Um, but then again, that was just way too slow because you try to adjust that spline, and and Revit would just churn and churn and churn because when you start getting like hundreds of adaptive components and every adaptive component to get the to get the gap you know that was controllable like that i think we had a triple nested adaptive family you know so we had like a panel inside of another family inside of another family and then that actually was the fa so you're like pretty soon you're dealing with like way too many interdependencies and it just starts getting really really slow so for this one because we we just went straight to using a mesh instead this was actually sculpted in blender uh, Blender is a sculpting tool set that's really awesome and fun to work with, and, and we just wanted to be just sculpted these in Blender really quickly and came up with forms that were that we liked, and then we ran with those. And for these, because the script, the um, the, the Dynamo nodes that we have, they crap, they'll crash if you try to give it um, an endgon that's not flat because it can't result. It doesn't have like some kind of auto triangulation resolution thing in there yet. Um, so in this instance. We made these forms and then we ran them through Rhino to, to flatten all the faces, um, just because Rhino has a nice little tool for doing that. Uh, you could have used Blender or you know, some other mesh, something that can manipulate meshes and flatten out a face um, to do it. It would have worked too, so. What was the tool you Rhino? What's that? What's the name of the tool you Rhino? I'm not the Rhino user, B's the Rhino uh, user. What's, no, do you remember the, uh, you just create those blocks, like you just cut you get a solid oh, and you do negative modeling and you have yeah, yeah. the flats. And by, yeah, by default, you wind up with flat faces, yeah. Mesh toolkit is really great. That can help. It's the bunny guy that will uh, really quickly re-topologize your mesh as much as triangles are concerned to clean it up so you don't have like really nasty triangles. Anymore. Yeah, yeah, and there's some good, um, there's some tools inside of Blender for the mesh retopologizing, um, which is a pretty common thing that you have to do for animation that w could be applicable for, for some of this kind of optimization stuff too. But it was a good question. Um, any, any other questions before we open up? I mean, I have a couple examples we can kind of parse through and, you know, so I don't want to keep you too long. Yeah? From the, the Dynamo space to the CNC machine, Yeah. what happened? In there? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so. Uh, Caesar was asking, so Dynamo spits out all these DXFs. How does that get to the actual CNC router, right? And um, there's an in-between step that a, a lot of designers that haven't worked with CNC tools before aren't aware of. There's a whole world of CAM software, right? So you have your um, you have your authorship uh, software, right? So you're working in Revit, or you're working in Rhino, or you're working in like a mesh-based modeler, or you're drawing things in Illustrator, like whatever. Then all of that goes to a CAM package, right? The CAM package is the thing that takes your 3D models or your 2D vectors and translates them into actual jobs for the tool to run, okay? Who here has used like a 3D printer, uh, even just a cheap desktop one, right? So, okay, so essentially, you know, when you do your like, Cura, like you use Cura or you use like the app that I don't know what MakerBot uses, but you know, the one that like lets you set up a job where you, I'm importing in a 3D model and this is, I'm gonna print it and it's gonna be this big and it's gonna be over here on my print bed. That's essentially a CAM app, right? CAM is a computer-aided manufacturing. And it, some of the higher end old school CAD package like uh, the uh, Siemens UX and Katia and stuff, it's all married together, right? CAD and CAM. And back in the 70s and 80s, that was, it was called CAD CAM because it was all one thing. Um, now we use a couple different CAM packages. Uh, in this instance, we're using something called um, Aspire, which is from Vectrix, which is um, like their VCarve Pro Pro um, tool. It's a pretty good entry level two and a half D CAM package. For some of the more complex CAM stuff, sometimes we'll use Fusion 360, which has HSM built into it. Um, and again, like if you're using, like if these were all getting water jet cut out of steel, you'd use a totally like 
Uh, you know, there's CAM packages that are specific for water jet cutters that you have to utilize. And then the last step is there's actually a control software, which is the software that's on the actual tool. And so the control software actually loads those jobs that were prepared for it and just runs through it. And most of the time that control software is brutally stupid. Like um, if you've ever read like, you know, PostScript, uh, who here has ever dealt with PostScript code or anything like that before? So like PostScript is actually a world smarter than what most CNC tools are using. Uh, most CNC tools are using something called G code, which is 50 years, over 50 years old and horribly broken in a lot of com uh, contexts. And it's literally, a little bit more complex than logo programming language. It's like move here, move here, move here, turn this thing on, move here, move here, move here. That's literally all it's doing. There's no real, you know, logic loops or feedback. And some of the more complex machines can have that, but literally the tool is just running a script uh, to run, you know. So, um, you know, the, the control software, the CAM software, and the design software are three distinct things but they are kind of overlapping circles because there's things that I can do in our, like our CAM software, which I, I can show you here. Um, this Aspire tool that we use a lot for our CAM, it has like a, a crappy little CAD tool built into it. So it has the equivalent of like bad AutoCAD LT slash uh, Illustrator <laughs> here, where I can draw vectors and I can edit stuff and make changes, right? And when I'm setting up my jobs to do stuff, so if I wanted to, I could just open Aspire and just draw the thing that I want to cut out. I don't have to actually draw it in CAD first, right? So there's overlap between the tools. And then on the control end of things, I can just walk up to our CNC router and just type into it, cut me out a circle of this size starting here, right? And it will just, you know, do that. So, um, so there's, there's overlaps and it's important to understand where to manage certain things, right? So like when we're modeling stuff inside of Revit or, or even in this whole Dynamo kind of process, we're assuming like all the plywood here, you know, we're assuming all of this plywood is exactly three quarters of an inch thick, right? Because we don't know what size the plywood is until it shows up off the truck because the plywood varies from batch to batch a little bit. And trying to like measure all of that before you actually model it is insane, right? You, you're trying to manage it that way. It's too complex again, and you're going to have you know, uh, just have too much stuff to deal with. So we, we kind of abstract it and figure, okay, we're gonna just assume all of this is exactly three quarters of an inch thick plywood. And then when we actually set up the job in Aspire before we run it, we can measure with digital calipers the thickness of the plywood and Aspire in the tool pass themselves, when you set up the tool pass, have the ability to set up like um, allowance offsets and other things that you can do that will make the tool path a tiny bit bigger or a tiny bit smaller so you can adjust for, you know, to compensate for different I issues and stuff. So again, um, and this is a whole nother talk about digital fabrication, but um, where, you're managing, where you're managing those tolerances uh, along the way is critically important to being able to make stuff uh, productively. So, but it's a, a good question. So yeah, there's a whole, you know, what we're doing here with the Dynamo stuff is uh, stuff that a lot of people call rationalization, to where you have a 3D model, like I have a mesh or I have a Rhino, a Rhino file or I have a Revit file, and I need some way to, to turn all of these things into real parts that are ready for fabrication. That's what we call rationalization or fabrication modeling, right? You know, I'm taking my design model that captures the design intent of what I want the thing to look like and kind of the field I want it to have, and now I need to go through the process of taking that and turning it into the actual parts and pieces, the fabrication intent, if you will, of how it's actually going to get built and go together. And then the next step after that, uh, that I was talking about is isolation. And that's what we're using the, the dy this Dynamo tool set for. We're using it for rationalization to go through and like make all these panels for us, label them all, make them all 100%, and then export them all out as flat 2D DXFs. Because Aspire here just wants a DXF file that's full of like triangles laid out, right? And Aspire, uh, the CAM software has a uh, nesting capability, you know, to where you can actually like grab all the parts and just say, okay, fit these onto plywood as best you can and it'll rotate them and puzzle them together as best it can, right? So we're not worrying about trying to do that in Dynamo. Theoretically, you could, you know, you could write a nesting routine or something inside of Dynamo, but realistically what we did instead is we just had Dynamo lay those things out in an array so that when they came into Aspire, you could grab them and group them really easily and then just tell Aspire to do the nesting, right? So again, it's like, where are you managing that complexity 
uh, most effectively along the tool chain really has a huge effect in how productive you can get this stuff done. So. I have a question. Yeah. The triangle, the first and second example. Yeah. The first one was a material. Is it plywood? Uh, yeah, all of these are plywood. So you said you assume the same techniques. So when you have that, you, you actually bury the gap as you go up, right? Yeah, yeah. Is so um, yeah. did you also really cut the gap? Yeah. Well, all those triangles were cut out by the CNC uh, right, router. Right. So it's a void, right? You're you're not feeling anything between. Right. Correct. Yeah. There's no. That's just air. In so between. if you end up doing mesh instead of electric component, you actually have to manage the gap like, with the consideration of the thickness. So you have to base it on like one side if you were to like rather model with the thickness. So when you decide to just mesh, right? Mm -hmm. Then your gap is actually mm -hmm. becoming too. Deep. Is not right. Yeah. That controls it. So you set a min minimum offset so you decide what you want the front to look like. And there's a parameter of where you say, oh, I want a quarter inch like from the center of the mesh. Yeah. You can determine how much is going to go in front and how much goes in back. Mm -hmm. And then Dr. Mm -hmm. Math magically calculates the size so that of the gap that you need to get that, that the effect. Are on the right. I, I actually had almost identical situation, but I had to do it as a uh -huh. So it was like extremely challenging to yeah. manage the gap. Yeah. To make it unified, because in, in my case, it was the uniform gap yep. throughout. Yeah, yeah. That's how we, uh, what B is talking about is these right here. We wanted the gaps to be really uniform throughout the whole thing. And that's how we did it, is we managed it, where essentially, like, they're flat, like you said, because it's a mesh. But then by using vector math, we were able to get the offset so that bevel always wound up in the right spot behind it, so that you'd always get a consistent. Yeah. So it's that yeah. part you managed to do inside the dynamo. Yes. So like, cause you know, I had to actually wait like twenty minutes or so every time I change something. Yeah, that's why we started just yeah, doing right meshes in dynamo instead. Yeah, yeah. cause the, that's why that's why we had abandoned the. I mean, I I wish we could do this all with adaptive components because then you maintain a lot more design control. Um, but uh, ultimately, B actually was the one who kiboshed me because I was like, we should keep with adaptive components, and B's like, that's insane, and. It's and she was right. We're, you know, had to just uh, step to just doing meshes and feeding them through. So dynamics. I just spend it like every every day at the end of the day and go home. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like old printers. Mm -hmm. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yes. You know, they won't be yeah. Well, and this is and it's a it's an important distinction to think about. Um, that's a, a really key fabrication issue because. Um, We've seen where people do projects like inside of Rhino and then unfold them using the Rhino unfolding tools. And Rhino just assumes everything's made of infinitely thin paper when you unfold it, right? So you're not actually going to get the right results with the unfolding sometimes because there's no K factors. There's no like compensation for the fact that things shrink when they fold sometimes. Like if you're doing like, so if this was like, the reason I'm saying this is if these weren't separate panels held together by a connector, but if this was like, supposed to be folded metal instead, we'd have to do a different rationalization technique to get something that would work properly for that because of the, the way that edge would work, right? So, you know, that the material thickness and where that thickness is and how you're compensating for it is a really critical thing to, to get things to work the work the way you want. It's a good example of where the design intent in this case and in your case where you want the seams to be really consistent will inform the fabrication model and, and make a problem that you have to try to solve in some way. And in our case, we were able to automate that some by writing some custom nodes inside of Dynamo. So any other any other questions? Or, yeah. Is there any are there any nodes you'd like to show off in the package that you publish? B, is there anything? Open up the two files and the question. The DSF one or the fake one. Um, yeah. And you can see that the load is kind of making it this big one? Yeah. See, should I open it up in this one? Yeah. See if that works. There we go. There we go. 
Oh, it's. I did. I did download the library. What's that? It says it's in the package manager. Oh, wait a minute. What the hell? That's weird. All right. Sorry, everybody. You don't have to do it through Revit? Uh, I mean, with the. Oh, sorry. With, this is the new. We just put um, Dynamo 1.0 on here, and I just put the new package on here, and I hadn't had time to test it before we came, so. So I have to, I'll launch it up from Revit and it'll work then, I think. Uh, it's crashing. Oh, I, I think I got it. Sorry, everybody. One second. And then I got to run here in a little bit, so unfortunately. Uh, oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, it was set to auto run and it was crashing, but um, so this is the bake one. Yeah. So those are all the options. And it's like you're importing an SAT. Had an automatic scaling thing to make it the right size. And from the mesh, you have a panel system, and those are the things that go into it. So, you can, yeah. uh, so like that's that you can control. Yeah. Um, so like that's one of the custom nodes from our. Yeah. yeah. So there's like several things like with that you can determine your clearance bevel angle, how much it's going to stick out in the front versus the back. Yep. And then that feeds out to, you know, making. <laughs> so that's that mesh pulled in and then rationalized by that script into this form. So. As a placeholder, like we had to sh send them essentially like layout drawings of what the benches were going to look like, how big they were, and that in the context of their booth. So again, you know, we kicked this out and brought it back in. So here we go. So that's how they have labels and labels are in different layers, so you can look at it differently, which means you've got a CNC, you can have labels, and Right. 
So here it is, it's making the DXS right there. And that's what B is talking about, where there's a cut and a label as two different layers in the DXF. Because then in the CAM software, you're able to just say, select everything on this layer, and that's what we're labeling with the Sharpie and everything on this layer. We're actually processing and cutting out and stuff. So, Where are you generating the labels in your the labels are auto generated. It's uh, the labels are embedded into the mesh geometry, so um, created a whole entire mesh topology thing. Yeah. And um, each one has a unique base number as well as edge number. That's part of um, the parsing of the model that you input into it, um, and it retains normal information from the mesh input. So the way that the normal faces is the front versus the back, so that's like the input, uh, how you can pull this in the input in the output is, um, for some of them you can input a spline, like if you draw lines, you know, the numbers go in a certain order, but that hasn't been input, and then taking this point, it right. as necessary. So you can look it up by this number. Any any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Um, so what led you to kind of focus on Revit and Dynamo for your studio? Oh, um, started our studio a long time, like like eight or nine years ago, and um, <clears throat> I used to be the firmwide Revit nerd for Gensler. Uh, and then like bought a CNC router and started making stuff and then that got so busy I had to quit the day job and just do that do my own thing instead 90% of the work that we do actually so while Revit isn't the strongest modeler there's other things like Rhino and stuff that are stronger modelers the stronger modeler is totally missing the point of the larger picture of what we're doing right like the larger picture of what we're doing is um, a lot of like, you know, this sort of stuff, like commercial interiors and things like that. So like this long now project that we did, like that was a model that we modeled in Revit that got exported out and CNC fabricated, right? But those bookcases were made by a millwork subcontractor. We had to do permit drawings for the whole space to get the GGNRA to sign off on it and to get the park service to look at it and the health inspector and, you know, so trying to do all of this in like Rhino and AutoCAD is insane, right? Like it's way too much time. Uh, to try to do permit drawings in this like super broken old process, right? Mm -hmm. So for us, um, using Revit, we have all of the advantages of BIM, right? And we realized very early on how to export things out of Revit for CNC fabrication, and Revit can model things accurately enough for CNC fabrication, it's not an issue, right? Um, the only issues that we have is there's certain, you can't get below a certain feature size inside of Revit, which is no limitation for us because we're making furniture, mm -hmm. right? Um, if we were modeling like parts to go into engines, it would be a problem, but for us it's not a problem. As long as it's longer than like a 128th of an inch, we're good, you know? And, um, and, it, and, and there's no accuracy problem, right? Like uh, if something is like an exact length, it's, it's an exact length down to like 10 or 12 decimal places. Um, just because Revit, it, there's no rounding error. Like just because Revit can't get really, a single thing can't get super tiny, it doesn't mean it's rounding all of those other larger numbers mm -hmm. down. All those larger numbers maintaining their, their stuff. So, so it's kind of one of those 80-20 kind of optimization problems, where it's, theoretically we could model things better in Rhino or Inventor or whatever because it's got a stronger modeling tool set, but we'd be giving up all of that documentation, all of that BIM, and so that, that part of the project would take a lot longer, and, and that's actually a bigger chunk of what we're doing a lot of the times. Um, even these, uh, even these shipping container project, we had to do nice shop drawings to give to studios to be able to collaborate with them to be like, this is what it's going to look like, you know. And by doing it in Revit, it was really easy and fast to do that and make really nice looking shop drawings. And so that's kind of why uh, we standardized on, on on top of Revit. One is that we just knew it really well. But the other issue is that, honestly, it's really painful to work, for me at least, I, I've never really gotten into Rhino because working with um, solid-based destructive modeling as opposed to sketch-based parametric modeling is, is really difficult for me because I've been working in sketch-based parametric modeling for a really long time. And so going back, it just feels like a huge step back to where I can't just 
quickly edit sketches and parametrically drive things around. And you can argue that, yeah, in Grasshopper, you can make parametric models inside of Rhino, but you have to start from that. And you, and you have to put so much work into getting where you're just starting out of the box with Revit. Like out of the box in Revit, I'm already dealing with parametric models and it's great, right? Like if they can make it super easy. And um, the other thing too that I really like about Dynamo in general, not so much for this kind of fabrication stuff, but for some of the other things that we've used it for, is you can interject it into the process where you need it and then it gets out of the way, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of having to start with it, work inside a Rhino, bake it, and then do my documentation somewhere else, I can just be working in Revit the whole time and make like a custom family that has parameters that I can flex and then just make a little Dynamo script that will grab that family and manipulate it based off of something that I want to have it do. And then when I'm done with the manipulation, I can just forget about Dynamo and just carry on on the project. So I don't have the example on my laptop, but um, and we wound up not doing the solar shades anyway, but we were doing a project where we were about like halfway through DD, if you will, you know, on our way into permit drawings. And um, this big live work complex, and there was these window shades where I wanted to optimize, you know, for sun shading sort of thing. And so I just made a little Revit family that I could parametrically flex, and then I made a Dynamo routine that would just iterate through and figure out what the optimal angle was for them. And I could do that without interrupting everybody else who was working away on the permit drawing set, right? And then once we got what the optimal length of those things were supposed to be, we could just forget about Dynamo and just carry on with the Revit project. And then in the end, those got killed because of the budget and taken off the project anyway. And so by doing it in a way that didn't take a ton of time, wasn't, it wasn't like a huge loss. It wasn't like somebody had baked like weeks worth of work into some custom grasshopper rhino iterative scheme to figure this problem out. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so that's pretty much the main reason is that honestly, at least in our little world of our niche that we're doing, it's, it's better. You know, um, we, about 80% of what we do, we do inside of Revit. We use a little bit of Rhino sometimes. We use a little bit of Blender um, for like mesh-based sub-D style modeling. We'll, we'll turn to Blender. Um, and again, that's just partially because I really like Blender and learned how to use it. And there's some really cool things inside of Blender that I really like. Um, and then uh, we'll use Inventor for uh, folded sheet metal. Um, so like the, the tail, they're hard to see in this picture here, but right here there's a, here I'll zoom in on this guy. So these uh, crazy Burning Man art cards that we helped make. That that tail there, that organic form was actually modeled inside of Revit initially uh, because I just knew it better and I needed to be able to make flat carvels because each of these is a flat surface that just twists in space. It's not doubly curved, you know. Um, and but then we pulled this into um, Rhino to take these skin parts and lay them flat because we knew that the amount of uh, distortion that Rhino does when it flattens things wasn't going to affect us in this instance, right? And then those got plasma cut out, and then there's bulkheads on the insides of these that are all just like um, flat pack steel that just slots together and welds. So it's slotted together and tack welded and everything just bolted together. All of that on the inside was modeled inside of Inventor because it has this really nice sheet metal tool set where you can just be like, I, I need a tab, I need a tab, I need a slot, I need a thing. And then you can just be like, okay, now lay all my parts out and flatten them all out for you. And like, you know, so, you know, it's kind of using the right tool for the right thing. But, um, but still, like, majority of what we do is based inside of Revit because it is the right tool for a lot of what we're doing, you know. So, yeah. Yes. I mean, because I get asked sometimes, like, why aren't you using Katia and stuff like this? And it's like, yeah, <laughs> I don't even know how to, like, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I don't even know where to, that. yeah, I don't even know how to, how to really address that. So, that's very Rare. What's that? Oh yeah, I know. It's a. I mean, we're kind of space aliens. I mean, uh, uh, for a long time, we we. I started doing some consulting work with Autodesk a couple years ago, and like the first week there, I inadvertently and accidentally uh, settled a like five year long debate that had been going on between the manufacturing team and the architecture team because the manufacturing team was utterly convinced that you couldn't use Revit for uh, CNC fabrication. Because it wasn't accurate. Because the modeling kernel wasn't accurate enough. You know, was their was their attitude. And I I pipe up and I'm like, oh no, we've been doing this for years. Take a look, all the stuff fits together. We cut all the stuff out. It works. Woo! It's great. You know? <laughs> and then, yeah. So, yeah. So, um, yeah. It's kind of funny, but well, thanks you guys. Thanks for your time. Thank you. I got a round. Okay. Is is your package publicly available? Yes. Yeah.
Uh, it's it's on GitHub under if you look up because we can or because we uh, because we Dynamo is the name of the package. If you look up because we can, you'll see us on on GitHub. And it, we just pushed out the latest one to the package manager as well. So if you just go to the Dynamo package manager and look for uh, because we Dynamo, it's a package with all our custom nodes and, and everything there. So if you go to the GitHub, um, there's example code. That bench is used as an example. So those those two examples that I put up there, those are publicly available on GitHub to download and play around with. So, all right. Okay. So, awesome. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. Good. How's it going? Thanks for using WebEx. Visit our website at www.webex.com. Oh, yeah. Hey, everybody. Thanks for thanks for telling me. Hey, everybody. Sorry, one Michael just reminded me. Not this Friday, but the following Friday, we're having an open house at our shop. Big robot arms dancing around, free beer. Um, we're over in West Oakland. I've got cards I can hand out if you want to swing by. You're more than more than welcome to. And I'll I'll be emailing out. Starts at around five, goes to like eight or nine, depending on probably nine, before we get frustrated and kick people out. But. A week from Friday. Uh, yeah, a week from Friday. I remember your notes. <laughs> it's uh, it's a ball quite a big Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Let me grab one. I've been Sorry, yeah. coming to this group virtually. Yeah. It's the first yeah. time I've seen you in What's your name? Cool. Eric Volka. Yeah. Oh, you guys are doing it. Uh huh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because there's totally some more uh, uh, interesting, like, mesh based conversation yeah. stuff. But it takes forever yeah. to label everything, to scale well, it down. I had a business trip. Yeah. Right. Forge conference. And I get to come to my favorite meetup group in the world. <laughs> I will say this, this, like, how did that this live broadcast on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Optimizing. Yeah. I mean, like just the amount of time spent doing the task based on the value of that task. Yeah. 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 Oh. No. Uh, um, the other thing, are you, is, uh, yes. I don't know if you, if you like mesh based stuff. I haven't played oh, around with it too much, but there's yeah. some crazy yeah. machines tomorrow. that are essentially oh, making but yours is better. But Blender is a open source yeah. 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 modeling tool yeah. or similar yeah. to 3D Studio so Max. Like you know? yeah. And uh, yeah, there's these crazy Russians yeah. that started making uh, essentially yeah. Grasshopper yeah. Blender. Yeah. So you can do nodal generative style stuff just purely within Blender. I haven't gotten deep enough into it. So I'm way to go. Kind of thing so in that. Yeah. that would be really yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. That would be a fun, yeah. uh, yeah. fun yeah. silly thing to do. No, absolutely. You know, just to, like, I, I love fun silly things. Yeah. Well, and I, I just, I, I'm, I'm always a big uh, booster blender just because I really, I really yeah. like the tool in general. Yeah. Thanks, you guys. Uh, yeah, pleasure to meet you. Yeah, yeah. I'm writing Dynamo. We'll talk next Tuesday. Next Tuesday, yes. I'm writing Dynamo for the business process. Yeah. You know what really helps? 4K monitor. 4K TV. <laughs> Even the Dynamo VM website, you need 4K to see the images. If you're on a 1080p, you can see the images. Sorry. You work here? We can digitally work here. We need a cigarette. AR. Around it, 
to run the definition for you compare the two smart oh yeah, we're going to interact with uh, Rhino in a much stricter way. Yeah, just I can make it, I'll definitely You know, we're having some easy things. Just a sweet thing. When it comes to fabrication, we're still we're dealing with that right now. We're trying to build this one. So it's amazing. One thing is to do a very small geometry. You can see every single element. The entire thing is Entire building. They look kind of crazy. Yeah. You do it with 20 pounds. Okay, no problem. You do it with 20 pounds. Yeah, it's pretty sharp. Yeah, it's not it's too fast. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's more than I got, until I saw these in the top of the year. Well, this is a different way to see it. It has a lot of it's really funny. But then, maybe, I don't know, everything, every single thing is is primary instead of doing all the rest of the world. Yeah. 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 I know. And the only, 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 the so the only two that I use are really What type of project do you want to do? Are you in a firm or are you in a firm? I'm in a firm. I have been doing my next one. I'm in a firm. 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 I'm in a um, oh, oh, um, to well, um, just go to the office. Oh, um, I'm sorry. No, 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 that panel can be a little bit of 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 a little bit well, we'll be there tomorrow, right? Yeah. Anyway, so, yeah. But uh, just, okay. I wanted to say, if either of you want to take along, you totally could. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hey, you guys want to No. Yeah, yeah. Nice to meet you. Oh, nice. Gensler, Firmway, Rivet Nerd. Yeah. yeah. So I was the Firmway, Rivet Nerd, and then Michael, when I left, <laughs> Michael took over Michael. Yeah, that's how we do it. Yeah, that's how we do it. What's that? Yeah, three, generations. three generations of 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 yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, you are. Oh, nice. For for uh, San Francisco uh, office or it works pretty much. Nice. Yeah. Nice. What's that? Yeah. He was just looking at you and how they're still like. Yeah. That's what I was struggling with that last year. Mm -hmm. 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 
Sometimes we can see the names mm-hmm. like when you have a marine officer from your ass and it's um, it, it's pretty so easy to say, Oh, you know, you do bring it over to the It does some kind of headless dynamo. <laughs> headless dynamo? Yeah. And you can also do select items. You can put in strings. You can put in some input before that. So it's really cool. That sounds that sounds like where it's going. And yeah. they're coming up with a pro version where you actually will have a you could have a form that it would illustrate some stuff and fill in a form. They're work they haven't come out with it yet, but they're working on it. Uh, but now, so it, good stuff. So I'm at the cl- my client in Modesto yesterday, mm-hmm. and I want I wanted to use Dino because it's front end. The, the draftsmen are going to be using my my Dino thing, mm-hmm. Dino Dino thing. 